I want you to run to Genesis chapter 1. You don't have to stand. I know it's a little warm. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. All nations, I love y'all. There's so much I want to tell you, but I'm going to wait a week. I heard it. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait one week. And then when I tell you, we're going we gonna to rejoice. Amen. I'm so excited because we added a brand new campus to our, to our story. This weekend, we had a chance to uh, install Pastors JJ and Trina Hairston, All Nations DC. Let's celebrate them. We're not playing about these. That's good, 30 minutes. Uh, we're not playing about this five days of prayer. I need you to be there. Who's going to be there? It's, come on now. Who's going to be at five days of prayer? It's going to be amazing. I need you to be there. If you're a leader, you have to be here. Otherwise, you won't be a leader no more. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's non-negotiable. Uh, we pray. So find what you got to do. It's in the evenings. It's not during the day. But we have five days of prayer. I'm enlisting some of my favorites to come and pray that week. I'm not going to tell you who yet. Uh, I know I'll be praying, and some people that um, that know the ways of prayer will be with us um, on within those five days. It's going to be amazing. So those who know, you know, intercessors, you can bring in talits if you want to, all that kind of stuff. We're gonna be praying. We're gonna be swinging from the from the AC units and all that kind of stuff. Whatever we tear up, we put back together, and. Uh, we're going to be everywhere in intercession, on the walls, on the floor, but it's going to be amazing. And so I'm excited about bringing us into new places of prayer and intercession. Y'all know this house has been earmarked for intercession, so we believe God for that. Genesis 1, 26. When you get this, say, I got it. Lord, help me. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea the birds of the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I've given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food and I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals the birds in the sky the small animals that scurry along the ground everything that has life and that is what happened then God looked over at all had all he had made and he saw that it was very good and evening passed and morning came marking the sixth day I'm gonna go to chapter 2 verse 1 as a matter of fact Instead of verse 1, we'll go to verse 5. Well, verse 4. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there was no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living soul, a living person. Then God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. There he placed the man he had made. We've been in this new series called Roots for a while. Have you enjoyed it so far? We're talking about what's at the bottom level of who we are as a people. And so we're reintroducing, or should I say, re-familiarizing those who have been a part of our journey about our root system. And we're introducing those who are new to our journey about our root system. So today we're gonna talk just a little bit, literally 20 minutes on the thought of worship. We're gonna call it there. Father, I need you in this place to do whatever it is that you wanna do. I ask you to touch me my body, my mind, my heart, my spirit, and also your people. In Jesus' great name, amen. Y'all praying for us? Good. All right, somebody shout there at me. Thank you. All right, so when we talk about the idea of worship, I think that, uh, and I'm going to move quickly, my concern in this culture, this generation, is that worship has become primarily about the external use of our limbs. And the, the positioning of our body in worship versus the posture of our hearts. 
And the part that really confuses me is that we are making worship into a culture, but the culture, there's nothing wrong with worship being a culture, but the culture of worship has a lot to do in this particular time and space with how we look doing it, what we're singing doing it, versus the positioning of our hearts. And that's the part that confuses me is because the scripture's right. That if we're going to worship him, we got to worship him in spirit and without an agenda. That's what that means. And so you need to understand that in order to really worship God, that first of all, we are spirits that are trapped in a body. That what makes us legal residents in the earth is the fact that we have flesh, sinews, blood, a heart. But what makes us alive is the spirit of God. And so what makes us legal is our bodies, but what makes us alive is the spirit of God. What makes us functional is our soul. The spirit God created first. The soul he blew into man. This, well, the body he, cre- he formed and the soul he blew into man. But when he created man and, and fashioned man and formed man and blew into man, he positioned man. And the first designated place for mankind was not the water. The designated place for mankind was not even outside. The designated place for mankind was in the Garden of Eden. Eating is symbolic of his presence. But the first time we think about, from a Hebrew perspective, the presence of God, we cannot associate the presence of God without associating mankind being placed there. That it was from the seat of Eden, or the positioning of Eden, or the placement in Eden, that Adam and Eve were supposed to rule out the earth. I need you to catch this. They were not to rule out the earth from any other seat. He placed them in the garden. It's in the garden where they named all things were brought past them. That is mankind's designated place or his prescribed environment to be used of God. The difficulty in today's culture is that many of us want to be used without having an Edenic revelation. We desire for God to bring us into certain places and revelations and rivers and upward mobilities in our career and our, and, our, and, our, and our journey and our walk and our finances and our families and et cetera. But we don't have Eden experiences. And where I've become problematic, where it's problematic for me within my heart is that it is possible to actually see yourself climb and God not be with you in the midst of your climbing. Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with us, don't allow us to come. When was the last time you prayed a prayer, dangerous prayer, that said, God, I don't even want it if you're nowhere near it. I don't even want this relationship if you're not breathing on this situation. I don't want this job if you're not the one opening the door. I know my gifts and my talents can get me there, but unless you don't want me, unless you want me here, please, I don't want no parts of it. And it's possible for doors to be open and God have nothing to do with it. It is possible for something to look like blessing and God has nothing to do with what you're calling blessing. It is possible that people can bring you into a space of honor and God still not want you in that place. What do you do? Uh Uh-oh. When you walk into a space and a place in your journey and your walk with God only to find out that you got everything except for him. And how do you know that? Because the deafening comes upon you. And you can't hear him the way you used to hear him. You don't feel him the way you used to feel him. And when you pray, you don't hear his whispering or his wooing or the romanticism of who he is in your journey. You don't even hear his word bubbling up on the inside of your soul. Instead, it's a deafening tone, a muted spirit. You decide to pray and worship, but instead you end up falling asleep. Why? Because somehow, some way, you have left your positioning of Eden to move into your own expression of what God is doing next. And if we're ever going to become a people of worship, we got to be a people that are chasing after Eden. We have to be a people who are looking for his presence. I don't want to call anything anything until I've spent some time seated in Eden. When was the last time you just threw your hands up at home and worship without any agenda? 
When was the last time you were driving in the car, put on some worship music, and before you knew it, you had to pull over in the nearest Texaco or Shell gas station or maybe the parking lot of a mall or a department store because the presence of God was inundating you in such a way that you knew if you kept on driving, you might hurt somebody else in the process. When was the last time you just sat in a place of worship and you didn't have to fight with your flesh about lifting your hands or even shouting to the God that's given you breath in your body. When was the last time that you danced with him? When was the last time you sung to him? Oh, y'all quiet tonight. When was the last time you actually, actually spent time with God and allowed God to just love on your heart? When was the last time that the melodies was in your inner man, not coming out of your mouth? When was the last time you just wept on your face in your bedroom or in your closet or underneath your bed or maybe on the kitchen floor in front of your family? Woo! Because the power of God and the weight of his glory was resting upon you. When was the last time you felt that thing, not the tingles on your neck, because sometimes I can be gassed, but I'm talking about that thing that lets you know that God is present in the room. And as Jacob said, you did not know it. Worship is part of who we are as the body of Christ. And we say this all the time. We don't worship God because of, uh, we worship God because of who he is. And it's true. But do you also worship God because of who you are? I don't just worship him because of who he is. I also worship him because of who I am. Because <laughs> if Romans 8 is true, and I believe it is, then what happens is he has put his spirit into my heart. Thereby it cries out, Abba, Father. So I don't just worship him because he's my father. I worship him because I'm his son. And I think the revelation of sonship was what's causing many people to have difficulty understanding worship. Because you don't think you belong to him. And how do I know this? Because every time you make a mistake, you take off running. And could it be that because of the scar tissue from our parents and what a father or mother may have, y'all underestimate the power of father wounds and mother wounds in the hearts of people, that initially you will see God the way you saw your people. And if your people were, were browbeating and taskmasters, then it becomes difficult to see God outside of that context. But one of the greatest things I ever learned about God is that when people turn their back on me in a season of error, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was the only one still holding me together, which transformed the way I saw him. Somebody said it is so. So, so Genesis starts off with all of these poetic things because God now forms the world. Help me, Holy Spirit. He forms the world with his words. Everything he says, he's literally painting. He is the Basquiat, if you will. <laughs> and he is painting with his words. There will be this, and he would see it, and then he would say it's good. There will be this, and he would see it, and he would say it's good. He ascribed praise to everything he said. Everything he said and saw, he prescribed or he, he designated praise that he called it good. He praised himself. He praised himself, except for the firmament. With everything he created, he praised it himself, except for the firmament. The firmament is the only thing he created with his mouth that he spoke, the planetary vortex, that he did not praise after he saw it. I think part of that is because that's our assignment. Because atmospheres belong to us. So I believe that that praise comes from us, that the responsibility of the believer is to control things in such a way that what he's looking for in that rim is what we give him. Now watch this. When it comes to intimacy, he prays himself, but mankind is the only thing he touched. In Genesis chapter 2, he's created man in Genesis chapter 1. He's a spirit, but he doesn't have a body. Chapter 2, he puts the spirit inside of a body or builds the body around the spirit, blows into it, but he is the only thing that God touches. Are y'all here? We don't see God physically touching anything else until, that's it. The only thing he touched was mankind itself. 
And that touching actually speaks to worship. It's the intimacy that he had with mankind. That God thought enough to, in the Hebrew, form is the word squeezed. He thought enough to massage me into my shape. Can we walk here for a little bit? He thought enough to know every mole, birthmark, knock kneed, flat footed, <laughs> bow legged aspect of who you are. Listen, come on now. Every puncture, every twist, every part of your pug nose, hair loss or hair growth, gray or blue or whatever else we color it these days. He found a way to know every aspect to who you are. So you got a God that has purposely and intentionally formed you, and we don't spend any time loving on him. He made you in intimacy. I'm trying to help y'all real quick. I only got a few more minutes. He made you in intimacy. And since he made you in intimacy and formed you in intimacy, intimacy is the expectation he had from mankind in the beginning. When I formed Adam, I never formed him to kick him out of Eden. I formed him so that we can have intimacy with one another. Are y'all hearing me? Just as I'm ruling here, I've given the earth to the children of men to rule there. But I did that in a way for us to have relationship with one another. Can I tell you that the beginning of your governance starts with worship? Because worship resets the relationship between you and man, between you and God. Worship puts us back into a posture that when I get through worshiping, I can feel like I can win any type of war. Worship resets your internal struggles. Because when you realize God can handle you just as you are, you redefine how you see everything around you. Maybe we wouldn't have so many mental health issues. If we really learn to worship, maybe there wouldn't be so much warfare in your head if you let him reset you in worship. Maybe you wouldn't need as much medicine to diagnose over you to, to take to make yourself feel better if we learn how to reset in worship. Maybe the real issue is that we've gotten away from altars and gotten away from the floor and started sitting on couches more than we came to him. I'm not saying that things don't have its place. But there is, I'm not, there is a poor, oh, there is a pouring that comes from the Father that knows how to reset his kids. So y'all quiet up in here. Because his spirit now begins to make love to your spirit. And your spirit begins to be romantic with his spirit. And in the midst of that, there's an exchange that happens between you and the Father. That you get less of you and more of him. And before you know it, you got so much of him that when you get through leaving that place, that you start to see everything around you in the way that he gave it to you to see it in the first place when was the last time you had an exchange between you and the father see the presence of God is mankind's original address it was not church we don't see church in the Hebrew context house of God until Genesis 28 are y'all here we saw Eden before we saw campus. We saw Eden before we saw a steeple. We saw Eden before we had a denomination. The first time we see the church, can I introduce it to you? It's Genesis 28. It's the idea that Jacob is now looking for a wife. He goes to see his uncle. He stops into a place called Luz or Haran. He stays there for a few moments. And as he's tired upon his journey, he lays his head upon a rock. It already sound like church. Puts his head down the rock, falls asleep, has an open air vision of angels ascending and descending. He sees the economy of how God moves in the earth. And he comes out of the trance and says, surely the Lord was in this place and I did not know it. He puts oil upon the rock, designates the rock, calls the rock not lose but Bethel, which means the house of God. It was a response to what heaven was doing. But the reason why we even erect a church is out of a response of what God is doing. When you come into a place of revelation with who God is, the response was a church. I'm, I'm giving you context. That this is a place where God should be moving. 
<laughs> this is a place where I actually could see the angels ascending and descending. But can I give you prayer? The first Bethel, Bethel was never needed until mankind was kicked out of Eden. But Jesus came to reset the relationship. So you're not so dependent upon Bethel when you can have your own Eden experience in your house. Here's the problem. Can I prophesy? I'm prophesying that there shall be Edens in your house, Edens in your kitchen, Edens in your bedroom, Edens in your vehicle, Edens in the parking lot, Edens on your job, Eden in your cubicle, Eden in your office space, and Eden, uh, Eden in your bathroom, uh, Eden in the parking lot, and Eden when you walk. That God's desire is for us to walk with him. The Bible says, sit down. That Enoch walked with the Lord, and he was not. Now, that thing troubled me because the first rapture is not in Revelations. The first rapture is not the story of Elijah being taken up in the whirlwind because he knew his day was coming. He even told Elisha, he said, hey, man, if you follow me when I go up, he knew he was going. God spoke to him in intimacy and told him, you're going to go up. And I thought it was interesting because he knew exactly what day he was going. If you follow me this day, you'll, you'll catch that mantle. Enoch, we see very little about him. We see two sentences. We know he's born, we know he walked with the Lord, and we know he disappeared. I thought that was very interesting because I don't believe that God is rapturing people like that now. But it's a principle there. That you, you, can walk with the Lord and then you not be you. <laughs> that it's possible to be so hidden in him that they no longer see you. An apostle do hard walk with the Lord, and he was not. I want it to be said that when you see me, you don't see me. Jesus Christ. That you see him instead of seeing me. Here's the problem. We see you as you're walking with the Lord. Because somehow there's no transformation about who you are when you first started walking with him. And my fear is that we're so busy trying to capture the presence that we don't have revelation that we're already around it. We're trying to manifest him to come because we don't have revelation that he's already there. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't capture the presence. No, no. You have to be aware that he's present. I'll give you an example. Lift your hands right now and cry out to him for a moment. He's already present. Now, according to 1st, 2nd Chronicles 7, 14, I don't have much because we're going to do some demonstration in a moment. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, that's worship, and turn from their wicked ways, that's die. I will hear them from heaven. That's his address. I'll forgive them and I'll heal the land. When you worship, here's the principle, heaven opens. You want to see God move, worship. Worship opens heaven. Now listen, it's by faith that you know this. That when I'm on my face, something's opening up over my head. Are y'all here? When I'm in my face, when I'm in his face, something's opening up over my head. That's number one. Next thing you need to know is this. Worship restores bodies. When he says he'll heal the land, that's not just talking about pestilence. That's also everything in that land. I believe that there can be a place of worship that comes upon people that I, without you laying hands, the presence of God resets bodies. Can I pull your expectation to that place? But you don't have to have a whole line and somebody with a white jacket. No, 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 no. We can literally worship ourselves into healing. I, I mean, I wish I had at least 25 people in here. That when you worship, your past is erased. Woo! But here's the thing. Here's the difficulty. If you don't believe you're a son of God, you'll never come into that revelation. But when you know that you're his, just like he's yours, then you realize that the Father is making your past work for you. Therefore, it no longer exists. 
all that stuff is hidden. So when you worship, he resets your past. When you worship, it destroys yokes. In the presence of God, yokes are destroyed. I remember one time, man, I, I used to, man, let me tell you, this is true. I used to want to be in his presence so bad. I just, we, we had gotten to, I got introduced to it as a child. I remember being nine years old, and they had us on, I grew up in an old school coaching church. They had us on the altar. And, uh, man, you know, you, thank you, Jesus, 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 you know. So, <laughs> and one time they was, they was in our ears yelling it. We, I was yelling it back. And it's all the kids, though. It wasn't the adults this time. It was the kids, kids and teenagers. And we was on a mourner's bench. You know, some, I, you know, half this church don't know what the heck I'm talking about. But there was a, a, a wooden bench with a cushion. And you had to pick the cushion up and set the cushion down in front of the bench. So when you got on your knees, you wasn't on the hardwood floor. You was on the cushion. Mourner's bench. You know. So it was on the bench, and we praying, and we praying, and we praying. And I felt the presence of God, like nine years old, came through the room, touched me where I was, and gripped me. And I remember feeling like, I'm not speaking in all the tongues, but why can't I stop crying? I was arrested at nine years old. Because of corporate worship. When you got that revelation and when you come through these doors, that corporately we're going to see a move of God. Even people who are tiptoeing with it. I need y'all to catch this. The adults fully had understanding of what was happening. I'm nine years old, but because of the corporate grace in the house, something happened to my nine-year-old body that I never forgot what happened. That even when I turned my back on Christ at 16 and began to alam do Allah in secret. Y'all quiet up in here. Something in me still ended my little Islamic prayers in Jesus' name. Y'all ain't ready for this? So stupid because I understood that when I'm talking to this particular deity, he don't have nothing to say. But when I talk to Christ, like something supernatural happened to me. So when you worship, your mind is balanced. I'm trying to get you to a reset. When you worship, your peace is revealed. His truth is revealed. His love is revealed. His joy is revealed. But the real problem that when we're having all of these issues is that we're not connected to there. Maybe it's not a teaching problem, preaching problem, or an anger problem. Maybe it's an eating problem. Perhaps maybe as a body, sometimes we forget our address. I have been to several places recently, airports and stuff, and I forget where I parked my car. And I'm like, when I get back to San Antonio, I'm like, oh, what floor did I, what, I don't remember what floor, what, last time I parked on this floor, and this, I don't know where if I parked on this, next time I get to Uber, because I don't know what the heck's going on. Thank God for a key fob. Because when I'm lost, and it happens often now, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I used to be good at it. Now, <laughs> got to take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm embarrassed to even say it, but it's true. But one night I was coming back to San Antonio from somewhere, and I remember thinking, like, where did I park my car? Normally I park on the fourth floor, but the fourth floor is back. I ain't go to the fifth floor. I went to the third floor. There was nobody else around, so I had nobody to ask. There was nobody patrolling the area to see, you know, nothing. Just me. It's late. It's 11 something at night. And nobody's at the airport in the middle of the week. I took out my key fob. Wasn't a lot of confusion and distraction, not a lot of people around. I actually could hear from my car. So I forgot where I had parked it. Took out my key fob and started pressing the button. And I could hear it, boop. I wasn't scared anymore. Because as long as I could just hear it, I knew eventually I'd find it. I think most of us need to grab our key fobs when we can't feel where God is and start looking to see if we can feel it or at least hear him. But once I heard it, I was okay. I knew I wasn't too far away from where I was going to be, and eventually I'd get back to my address through my vehicle. Are y'all here? One of the biggest issues we have is I don't think we are listening 
You're trying to figure stuff out on your own. And the father's like, your address is here. Quit trying to fight it without coming to me. Get back into your Eden. Somebody shout yes. yes. I'm done here. It's the last scripture I got is this. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. In every place, I want men to pray with holy hands, lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands, lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. There's a principle here. You can't worship man. You can't worship with agendas. We can't worship upset with one another or upset with other people. It's difficult to get into that space. One of the things that earmarked our congregation years ago, and I'm done, is that we decided we're not going to have a lot of fluff in our service. We were so broke that we couldn't even afford uh, church bulletins. Do we still do those? Okay. We couldn't afford it. So we wanted to do it for our first service, but we were so broke. We were like, man, look, how much does it cost if you had the Kinko? This much. Forget it. We're just going to have to tell people what we're doing. <laughs> this is 11 years ago, and uh, we didn't have the money. So because we didn't have the money to do a lot of stuff in each room, the only thing we had was word and worship. Let me testify real quick. Third service into our church, we had a young lady. Um, I forgot her name. It, is, it doesn't matter. But she had a kidney issue. And uh, they, the doctors told her, you'll never have kids and all that kind of stuff because she had been violated. Uh, I think about a sexual assault or something like that happened. But whatever happened to her, it messed her up so bad that she had some kidney issues, some dam liver damage and all that kind of stuff. So this young woman um, is probably like 19 years old. And uh, difficult space. Went to worship. I don't know what song we were singing. It doesn't matter. Again, we had no other agenda but just worship. We're singing. These young people, hands lifted up. Everybody's crying out to God. And this young lady takes off running. Boom. Nobody knows what's going on. She's running because she's literally uh, having to use the restroom. I know that's interesting, right? Pastor Lisa follows her to the restroom. She, she comes out. She's screaming. And she says, uh, I'm, I'm healed. Like, healed from what? She, the Lord told her, pull your catheter out. First time in two and a half years, she urinated by herself. Hold on. Here's the powerful part. She's had like three kids since. I didn't lay my hands on her, and I've laid my hands on thousands. Nobody prophesied over her. We prophesied to hundreds. Literally, in the presence of Jesus Christ, because of corporate worship, without her even asking, she wasn't even asking him for it. He supernaturally touched her body. That's not it. We went to worship one time, and a woman was going deaf in one of her ears, Renee. She related to you. Going, she was going deaf, lost the hearing. She's at the altar in worship. Nobody laid hands on her. At the altar in worship. At the altar in worship. Hear what I said? At the altar doing worship. I said at the altar doing worship. Y'all missed it. At the altar doing worship, because I guess people believe you gotta have a, a permission to do that. At the altar doing her expectation took her to the front. She wasn't waiting to get permission from a pastor because she come to the front. She just walked up. And next thing I know, she started screaming. Like, what happened? The ear popped open. Nobody laid hands on her. Can I tell you something? In our Genesis, that happened over 70 something times in the first year. I said, Lord, I'm going to tell you something else. December 4th, 2011, I can say this. We had a man come, man of God come, preach for us and whatnot. He said, The supernatural is about to break out of this place like never before. I said, Okay, Lord, I believe you. He preached a message, and we're like, oh, man, that's great, a great message. It was okay. And uh, when he was done, he said, you know, gold dust, the stuff is going to fall. We're like, okay. Nothing happened. There was a person who was with us, guest preacher. He left out the room, and when he left, the Lord said, doubt just left. And I'm like, what does that mean? Anitra, little, walks up behind me with her hands cupped over. She says, PK, that's what she called me, PK. I looked and said, what's that? 
a feather manifested in her hand. Y'all quiet. I start looking up the ceiling like, I know we didn't let that man in here earlier than uh, we got in here. I look at the front row and people are looking in their hands because gold dust is all in their hands and on their, on their person. Some of y'all, was, many of y'all were there. That's not it. My dad who's working a sound in the back who don't do the foolery. <laughs> if, it's, if it's fake, he don't feel it. I don't believe it. He comes to the back. He said, you can't tell me I don't got this in my hand. He, I mean, crying, emotional. You can't tell me. I'm looking at this. God began to show up that when we begin to pray for people, gold dust would fall upon them in the hospitals while we're praying over the phone. Are y'all here? It was the presence of God. And he told me, he said, son, if you stop talking about it, I'll stop doing it. So people in, around me begin to criticize us, call us gold dust fellowship and, and uh, <laughs> feathers church and all that stuff. And I'm young, so I let that stuff bother me. And so then he stopped doing it as much. And I told him, Lord, my heart, my heart is to bring us back to a space of incredible worship. Because I want to see the supernatural like I used to see it. Now, he does amazing things now, but I want him to do even more. I don't want it to be just where we come to church and have a good time and shout and run and scream. I love that stuff. Trust me. Praise is definitely but there's a space in worship you can get to that he starts healing your inner man worship wins wars you don't even know you're about to fight worship is a future weapon worship goes ahead generations that your kids kids children will inherit moments that you spit on your face there are bullets that are assigned for kids you don't even know yet that are thwarted already in the spirit because of the moment you decided to be on your face. It's the least thing you can give back to the God that gave you breath in your body. We breathe to worship, not just because of who he is, but because of who we are to him. <laughs> he values that from his children. I don't even want a lot from you. You don't have to pray two, three hours a day. But when you think about me, whoo, when you just think about how in love I am with you, my prayer, his hope, his expressed desire is that it, it, it forces something in you to want to at least throw your hand up. That throwing my hands up is a reaction because it's the only thing I can do in my flesh that can kind of identify, because I don't have the words, that can actually kind of identify what my heart is really feeling on the inside. It's the only thing I can do. I don't even have the language or the words of addiction to even put together exactly what you've done and how much, how important important you are to my life but the least thing I can do is fall to my knees because it's the only thing I can say if I can't say it with my mouth I can say it with my body and my body just says Lord I'm yours and I miss you so much and I want to be in your presence I just want to feel your presence Lord bring me back to Eden bring me back to a space and a place where I'm overwhelmed with you that's all I really want that's all I really need it's not about a car or a relationship or a career, or a job, or a sermon, or a song. It's about the posture of your heart. And all I'm asking is if there's at least a hundred people in the room that want him more than you want to be in a team. You want him more than you want people to perform. You want him more because you want him to reset something on the inside of your heart. That's what you want. I desire you more than I desire anything else. I desire you more than anything else. I want you to spend the next few moments honoring your father. That's the whole purpose of today. I'm not worried about any other piece of this. It's your father. For the next minute or so, I want you to open your mouth and engage him. And watch Holy Spirit reset everything you've been fighting through in this season. Come on, lift it. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. This is what we do. This is all nations built upon the rock. This is what we do. 
this is who we are. This is our response. This is our response. Where are the worshipers now? Where are the people that will call upon his great name? Where are the people that desire him? The benefit is his presence. The benefit is the beauty of his holiness. The benefit is his heart. The benefit is his peace. The benefit is his joy. And if you haven't been in his presence and it's been difficult for you to press in, I dare you to even make your way this way. I just need to be closer to the fire. I got to be closer to him. I need him and with reckless abandonment, I just want him. I just want him more than I want anything else. Right now, I'm at my wit's end. And if I don't get into his presence, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to lose my mind. I can feel my emotions being everywhere. I feel my mind being everywhere. I feel like I'm losing myself. I feel like my flesh has overwhelmed me. But now my heart and my flesh cry out to a great God. Yeah, I need you. I need you like a city where there's no water. I need you. I need you like a valley that has no water. I need you. I need you. I need you like a people that are thirsty. Ho, 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 ho. Come and drink. Come and drink. Don't you put your trust in horses. Don't you put your trust in chariots. But we put our hope and our trust in the name of the Lord. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower that the righteous can run to and find safety. You are safe in his presence. You are safe in his presence. You are safe in his presence. Come on, Zion. Deep crieth unto deep and deep calleth unto deep. Deep has a noise. Deep has a sound. Deep has a sound. Deep has a soundtrack. Deep has a soundtrack. Deep has a sound and a soundtrack. Woo! Yeah! Lift up those voices now. Let's cry out to a holy God. Worship is our root system. Worship is how we get the job done. Worship is how we win. Worship is how we fight. Worship is our warfare. Worship is how we get into the future. Worship, that's what we do without an agenda. Without an agenda, we do it in the spirit of truth. This is why we worship him, not just because of who he is, but because we are who we are to him. I worship you because you're my father. I worship you because you are in love with me I worship you because you never thrown me away I worship you because you still desire me you still want me you still care for me you still breathe into me you still give me lung in my body you still give me second chances you still you're still consistent you're still faithful you still feed me you still clothe me I was young and now I'm old and never have I seen never have I been forsaken never have I been Come on here, Zion. Lift up your voices right here and cry out to a holy God. I said a holy God, a holy God, a holy God, a holy God. He's worthy. He's worthy, Mahaya. He's worthy. He's worthy. Let him reset your journey. Let him reset your story. Let him pour you a fresh glass of water. Let him renew. Let him renew. Let him sanctify you holy. Let him set you apart. Let him pour you into his presence. Come here, Eden. Come here, Eden. Come here, Eden. Where are the worshipers who will cry out to a holy God? That will cry out for their destiny. Cry out for their purpose. Cry out for future generations. Let that well come out of your belly. Let that well come out of your belly. Tell him how much you need him. Tell him how much you miss him. Tell him how much you desire him. I miss you. I miss you in the morning. I miss you in the evening. I miss you in the afternoon. Forgive me, Lord, for not coming to you and seeking counsel from people alone. But Lord, with my hands extended, Lord, with my heart lifted up, Lord, with my posture toward you, I engage you. Come on, church. I engage you because you're beautiful, because you're holy, because you're set apart, because you're righteous, because you're magnificent, because you're everything. You're my sustenance. You're my water. You're my food. Yeah. You're my protection. You're my peace. You're my healer. You're my deliverer. You are mine, and I am yours. And because I'm yours, I cry out to you. And I thank you for claiming me, for calling me, for saving me, for redeeming me, for making me yours. Come on, church, lift it. 
Hop, 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 out of your bellies, out of your bellies, church. Woo! Out of your bellies. Come on, cry out to him. Come on, cry out to him. Cry out to him. Cry out to him. Extend those hands towards the heavens. And for the next 30 seconds, I want to engage him all over the room, whether you hit this altar in your seat. Come on, engage him, engage him, engage him. You say, Apostle, how do you do that? You tell him how much you need him. And he whom you seek shall suddenly come into his temple. I said, he whom you seek shall suddenly come into his temple. Who's his temple? Your body is his temple. Your heart is his temple. And he whom you seek shall suddenly come. Come on, Zion, lift it, lift it, lift it. Worship has a sound. Worship has a response. Worship has a response. Where is your response? Where is your response to Eden? Where is your response to there? What is your response this afternoon? What is your response while you're watching at home? What is your response? Come on, church. Father, 
we repent as we are re-emerging as a people. Never again will we engage your presence without appropriate responses. And Father, I ask you even now in Jesus' name to reset the grace that you've designated this house for. <sighs> that you would trust us again with greater levels of the supernatural. And that our response would be different than what it was before. I thank you for all that you've done. But I have greater expectation for what you're about to do next. And Father, I prophesy miracle signs and wonders over your children. That as we worship, we win wars with worship. That the heavens will open up over this place like never before. And I thank you that today is the beginning of something brand new in all nations, San Antonio. I thank you for supernatural healing in the room. Deliverance without deliverance workers in the room. Greater expressions of your power in this room. And whatever manifestation you desire to see, we give you permission to do that again. This is your house. We shall be a people that respond to there. Let an Edenic revelation sit in our hearts and marry our spirits. And we're forever different because of your presence. And we give you the praise even now. Lift those hands for a moment. Those that can. Shout this with me. This is my response. In every season, every challenge, every difficulty, Every roadblock, every loss, every win, this is my response. <sighs> Call us to our faces, Father. Back to our faces. <sighs> With weeping in our hearts, back to our faces. <sighs> As you're healing our emotions, back to our faces. As you're fixing our new resolve, back to our faces. Woo! As you are affirming our sonship, back to our faces. Woo! As for 30 of y'all in this room, as he's affirming his sonship over you, he's madly in love with you. Quit punishing yourself for your mistakes. Who gave you permission to beat up on something that don't even belong to you anymore? You belong to him who gave you the right to destroy you. Back to our faces. We call this place Bethel. I said we call this place Bethel. House of God. Surely the Lord was in this place. We did not know it. Our response would be worse. Somebody tell the Lord how much you love him in this place. Prophet. If you know that your private relationship with the Lord needs to be reset, lift your hands real quick. Lift it, lift it. Wave it at me so I can see you. Differentiate yourself. All right. Keep your hands extended. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for a revival of worship coming to these sons and daughters. That tonight, no, today, that you will reset in them something fresh. 
bring them back to their first love. I pray for new wind to hit their bellies. That you will eliminate distractions and things that suck away from their space and their time and their energy. Even if it's people that have been sent from hell to deter their journey. That you will eliminate that relationship as well. You will bring them into a space of reset and worship. That when we gather again, the expectation be so high that anything can happen. And I give you the praise for it in advance. In Jesus' name. Those that love them, clap your hands, put your hands together. Let's receive the prophet.